Hello again, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Master of Professional Studies in Wine and Beverage Management, current student and faculty chat. My name is Robert Tremblay. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions at the Culinary Institute of America, as well as a 2010 graduate. And I will be your host today for the presentation. And I will also be joined by some special guests that I'll be introducing in just a couple of minutes. But before we begin, I just wanna go over a few housekeeping items for the presentation. Our discussion today is gonna to focus exclusively on our Master's of Professional Studies in Wine and Beverage Management. So what we've done is we've gone ahead and compiled some of the most frequently asked questions that we get uh, on a daily basis in the admissions office. Uh, and we're gonna pose them to our, our panelists today to get their experience from the program and really give their expertise um, on what this program has to offer. So I'm really excited to get to welcome our panel of uh, guests today. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to welcome them to the, uh, the webinar. We're joined today by uh, Jennifer Weiss, uh, who is a current student in the program. And then we're also joined by Timothy Bozinski, who is one of our assistant professors in the program and is also a 1997 CIA graduate. So Jennifer and Tim, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to have you both on the call tonight and uh, sharing your experiences about the program. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Happy to be here. Thank you so much. And so, Jennifer, we'll start with you. If you could just, you know, introduce yourself to the uh, the audience a little bit more. Tell us, you know, a little bit about what you're doing currently, uh, what drew you to the program, and uh, what some of your plans are for the future. Sure. Uh, so, like you said, my name's Jen. Uh, this program for me has actually been kind of how I sparked a, a career change. So, I've been in finance for about ten years. I, you know, did my undergrad in accounting. I went to get a master's in tax after, um, and I've been in and around accounting and finance for a, just shy of ten years. Um, and you know, it's it's not a completely unheard of story. You know, I the pandemic hit. I worked to transition to working from my kitchen counter and found that when I wasn't surrounded by my friends and my fun office and in the more exciting environment that actually the job part was kind of boring and I was very unfulfilled by it. Um, I've always loved hospitality. I've always loved food and wine and pairings and um, how it all comes together to create an experience. So I, you know, through some soul searching and some advice from close family friends was kind of referred to just looking at culinary school in general. And um, I have a, a close family friend who was like, you know, it's not just about being a chef. Like, why don't you just look? And it just had never even occurred to me, um, which is one of the reasons that I think it's so great that you're doing outreach with these programs now and promoting them more. People just aren't really aware of them as an option. So long story short, I found the program just through a simple Google search, applied two days later. I think I, I found it like five or six days before the application deadline, uh, two months before the program even started. So it all happened fairly quickly for me. Uh, so that was July of 2021. Um, and now I am just started my summer semester, which is my final semester of the program. So I will be graduating in August of this summer. Um, and yeah, I mean, I was very fortunate in that I do still have my finance job. They let me go part-time. Uh, and I also work part-time at a restaurant local to me as a sommelier as well. So um, I do a lot of wine pairing dinners. I do a little consulting with local restaurants. I do some events, um, freelance events as well. So it's definitely been a busy uh, two years for sure. But um, my plan for when the program is done is to... I'll leave my finance job, which they're completely aware of, and um, hopefully find something full time in the the food and beverage space. Great, that's that's wonderful, and congratulations on uh, your upcoming graduation. Very exciting. Very um, exciting. And uh, Timothy, we'll we'll go to you next um, to share a little bit about you know your your background and uh, you know your your role in the program. Right. So as you said, I'm a graduate of the Institute. So I graduated in 97. And when I was there taking my coursework, I, I obviously loved so much of it. Um, but I realized when I was taking the wine and beverage class that that was a huge interest of mine. And it was completely as fascinating, if not more fascinating than the entire world of of food in and of itself, because you kind of combine this food aspect to it, and there was the wine aspect to it, 
and it completes it completely keeps changing because there's new vintages and and you know in the past several years obviously lots of different regions have come on board so it's a constantly evolving sort of uh field so that was super interesting to me so i immediately started working in retail so i was working in new york city at a pretty major uh retail store for a while. Then I started to work for an import, I'm um, sorry, a distributor. So I worked in a couple of different areas doing distribution, some of which was education in there because I had a, had some background in teaching and, um, you know, did some sales um, as well, worked for an importer for a little while and uh, basically then um, decided at some point uh, with my partner that I would um, open my own store, my own business. And initially that was going to be sort of like a, a breakfast, lunch kind of place. But when we found the location that we're in, we basically realized this was an, an amazing opportunity for a wine shop. And so we went and directly kind of like opened the wine shop. So we're about to celebrate this summer, 17 years of wow. that. So um, it's been a long kind of like journey in that regard. And meanwhile, somewhere during that time, I kind of started working at the culinary as an adjunct. So I would fill in for the two major um, uh, professors, major main wine professors uh, at the school who had been there for about 30 years, both of which had taught me. And so I'd fill in for them for uh, sometimes short periods, sometimes long periods. And then when one of them retired, I um, made the transition to a full time uh, mm -hmm. in that way, and that's been probably about five years, four and a half years, uh, in a full time role, and then took on um, this position in in the master's program a couple of years ago, uh, or just a year and a half ago. Um, and so I'm responsible for about three courses. Um, those of you entering this fall would be seeing me for at least three courses um over the course of this and uh of this program so that would be global uh wine and beverage operations uh new uh wines of the southern hemisphere and entrepreneurship and innovation in wine and, and business so um some business courses but also some um focused one focused on um you know wines uh particularly so Wonderful. pretty extensive yeah, no, that's fantastic. Really excited to to hear, you know, both of you share your experiences with the program and, uh, you know, enlighten our, our guests tonight with with your your stories. So we'll start, we'll dive right into our first question, uh, which, you know, is one that I get quite regularly on uh, in the admission side of things. But, um, you know, the simple question of, you know, what students can expect during their first year of the program. Um, you know, I, I will kind of, you know, set the table a little bit and say that the, the first year of the program is initially going to begin in September, um, and that's going to begin with the first in-person residency, which will be done at the campus in Napa, California. Um, so that'll be uh, basically a week long. It'll be an introduction to the cohort. Um, it'll really, you know, facilitate an orientation, if you will, in a lot of ways, but then it's also going to get into some actual wine learning where you're going to get into viticulture and viniculture learnings um, from around the Napa Valley. So really, you know, integrated learning from that perspective. Uh, but then immediately following that, you're going to jump into your online classes the following week after you return from that first residency. Um, and really one of the most important elements of this program is the fact that you're going to have really a balance um, of both business-based courses to go along with wine tasting courses. So um, very important part of that. So you're going to cover you know everything in that first year from um, New World Wines, really focusing in that area, both in the Southern Hemisphere and Northern Hemisphere hemisphere, but also getting into, you know, global wine business structures and, and things of that nature. So, um, Tim, we'll start off with you. If you can talk a little bit about, you know, sort of the, the if you could give like a thesis statement to what students are going to experience in those, those business-based classes and the wines courses and, you know, you know, what that all kind of entails. Yeah, happily. Um, so in the business-based courses, and one of the things you'll see me in is global beverage operations right off the bat in September is that's really where we kind of take a really um, pretty comprehensive look at the the business of wine and beverage. And so the way that I kind of look at the course is this is the opportunity to think about all the different areas uh, in the business. So that is not just production, but it's also in terms of distribution, um, sales, and uh, you know some ideas about marketing and a, a number of different aspects. And so this is really, um, it's a, 
it's a very much an introduction, but it's also a very much a deep dive. And so you're going to be asked to, you know, think about, you know, the impacts of some of the decisions that have been made uh, historically or some of the um, changes that are afoot in, in terms of the movement, maybe more towards direct to consumer uh, sales that are happening in the industry. And if that's going to be a continued trend or is that going to uh, go by the wayside. So we're going to be asking you to think about things like that. So it's not just essentially you sort of like doing some reading and sort of regurgitating everything. You got to kind of take that and then hopefully be able to um, kind of give a little bit of a spin to it to a degree and put your own like sort of like ideas into it. That's one of the things I try to I really look for is is um, having students be thinking from their perspective, like wh what's the direction that, you know, they want to go with this or they see this happening or what the impact's going to be for them in their, um, in their mindset. So I like to look for a lot of that kind of thing. So it's again, pretty comprehensive in terms of the world of, of beverage for the most part. Mm -hmm. And then for the tasting courses, it's a really, um, I really couldn't say more, especially when we're talking about the one that I teach in the Southern Hemisphere. It's a really deep dive into every nook and cranny of the wine world that you haven't really ever heard about or thought of. And, you know, there are places um, that you're, we're going to be talking about, like Hujuy and uh, different places in Argentina. And we're going to be looking at, you know, countries like Cyprus and their uh, production. Um, so we'll be looking at uh, areas that are sort of sort of either emerging or re-emerging uh, into the international market, the global market. And so it's a really um, big look. I mean, we cover a number of different countries in in a short period of time. So it's a, it's a pretty much kind of like uh, get on the horse and kind of gallop kind of thing when it comes to uh, wines of the Southern Hemisphere, for sure. And I'm, I know it has to be that way for uh, the other professors as well, because it's you don't really have, I mean, basically – you could get a degree in any one of these kind of like areas to a degree in a sense. So. No, that's, that's wonderful. And Jen, for you, you know, can you talk a little bit about your experience during your first year of the program, you know, from a student perspective, you know, we kind of got the nuts and the bolts of, you know, what the classes will entail, but you know, what was your experience like and uh, you know, how did you rise to the occasion and what was, you know, everything you had going on? Sure, sure. Uh, so like was said already, you take after the in-person residency, which for me was transformative, to be completely honest. I had never studied wine before. I had no back. I mean, like I knew that I liked wine and I thought that I knew wine because I knew that a Burgundy was a Pinot Noir, which like I was like, that's pretty advanced. I was proud of myself. It's not. So I going into this was I remember coming home from the residency and being shocked at how much information I could learn in one week. I, I really do remember being absolutely just so excited for what it meant for the rest of the program and, and so excited and eager to get into the rest of it. So the first semester for me, um, it's definitely a little, this was my second graduate program. So I will say it's definitely a little bit different. The first one I did was all in person and all at night. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and just a different nature. This one, um, is a lot of independent study because it's a virtual program. So there's a lot of reading and a lot of writing that's, I think, to be expected with any graduate program. Um, but you know, there is a transition period, at least for me, it had been several years since I'd done something like that. So, it took me longer to get started writing papers and stuff like that. I'm much, much more efficient with it now than I was two years ago at the beginning of this process. But um, I think that that's, you know, kind of just part of going back to school. Um, I will say the first semester with the business course, I loved the first business course we took because for me, with my background, it was almost like a translation of everything I've done and how it applies to this new industry that I was trying to get involved with. Like mm -hmm. it took finances and, and Excel spreadsheets and budgeting and sales and, and numbers with the way that my brain works and it applied it to this new industry. So of course it wasn't designed for me that, you know, that just happened really well for me. Um, and it, so I really enjoyed that. Uh, the other course was Northern Hemisphere. I think maybe it's Southern Hemisphere for you guys, but either way, um, you get your wine kits in the mail and every, it's, they're not every week. It depends on how many you're doing, but any given week you could have a wine tasting, which is structured and you have a template that you fill out and, um, 
you write an essay on it. And that essay is, of course, you describe some of the things in your tasting, but I think really the purpose is to connect it back to your reading to say, okay, I found these qualities of the wine. Well, let's think about why do you find those qualities? Where do they come from? And it was about learning how to connect what you were tasting and smelling and seeing and and connect it back to the soil and the weather patterns and the climate of a region based off of your lectures and reading. Um, and I think that was one of the most important things that I learned um, in the first semester. Oh, that's, first year. that's wonderful. Yep. Um, I really kind of stepping into the second year of the program, which is kind of the second question is talking about, you know, what you can expect there. You know, it, it kind of begins with the end of the first year because the first year of the program, uh, the conclusion of it is going to be your second residency, uh, which is held during the Global Wine Summit. So that's a, a you know, an in-person event in, in Napa um, that students will attend for that second residency. But that's really going to set the tone for the second year of the program, which dives into, you know, obviously further beverage training. That's going to go beyond wines, where it's actually going to get into uh, different types of spirits, as well as non-alcoholic beverages and fermented beverages as well. Um, so, Timothy, if you can talk a little bit about, you know, how does this program expand beyond just wines, um, and what type of deep dive will they go into in those areas? Well, I mean, when you're we're, when you're talking about spirits and other beverages, I, I think, you know, Th those areas are are pretty expansive and they're becoming an even bigger part of the way we drink currently in this in this country um you know younger generations are moving uh and exploring a lot more having to do with uh, those other types of beverages so you're going to be looking at all, all the different distillations how they're being made you're going to be looking at you know obviously gins and vodkas and bourbons and distinguishing those whiskeys from other uh, other types of whiskey um, and so you're going to definitely be looking at that, rums, um, all of those essential beverages. But you'll probably also be talking a lot about, um, you know, other things that are aromatized and other beverages, uh, you know, Amaro's, different types of things like this and ways that you can use those. Uh, some ideas about, you know, mixology and so forth will kind of come through in the coursework as well. So you're definitely... Um, I mean, this is probably the most rounded program that I can think of. Um, you can get a certification, sure, but you have to get multiple certifications to kind of do everything that kind of happens in this program. It's This is the kind of like one-stop shop, and you kind of get everything, and you are being very deeply schooled on every kind of um part of the business per se, whether it's spirits, whether it's sake, that's another one um, that we're really kind of doing a little bit more of a deeper dive with as well. So you're going to be learning quite a bit about sake, which um, unfortunately, few people in the industry are really focusing on. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's a it's a pretty comprehensive look at all the different types of beverages, how to serve them, how to enjoy them, how to how to, you know, where they're from, what it's all about. That's that's great. And for you, Jen, you talk a little bit about your experience, you know, not only with uh, the, the different types of beverages, but, you know, with the, the focus on the business side of things and, you know, talk a little bit about managing the capstone project with that. We'll dive a little bit deeper into that area of things a little bit later on, but just sort of how you experience that working into everything. Sure. Um, so like you guys said already, uh, the second year is intense, uh, especially that i I know it has a longer name. I've been calling it the other beverages course. I mean, we covered soda, we covered water, we covered sake, cider, beer, every spirit than the ones you've never heard of. I mean, it's a, it's a lot. It's a jam-packed course for sure. Um, I think Professor Brzezinski is absolutely correct. I researched a lot of programs when looking at this. This is the only one I am familiar with that is not just a wine intensive um, that, that really goes into this level on all aspects of of beverage space, not even just the alcohol space, right? Because there are so many other beverages out there that are influential and and that matter if you're thinking about a, a business and an industry overall. So um, while the focus of the program is absolutely wine, um, this is a really unique look into other beverages. Uh, so that was more than I think I expected um, during the second year. It was one full course, but it definitely got a lot out of it. And I will say, I think some of, for, for me at least, I thought that some of the more 
fun and creative assignments came out of that class, like creating your own spirit line and um, things like that, that you could get really creative with and have a lot of fun with as well. That's great. Thank you so much for for both of your insights into that. It's uh, it, it's always cool. You know, I, I hear all about the wines and, and that side of it, but, you know, hearing a dive into some of the other areas and the expansiveness of the program is a, is a really dynamic element. So thank you for, for sharing that. So our third question, uh, you know, really dives into, um, you know, what are what's a typical week like for the online courses and and how rigorous is the work? And um, Jen, we'll start with you for this one, just to kind of get your experience mm -hmm. as a student. Like, how are you, um, you know, receiving your assignments? You know, how does the time management work into it? And, you know, sort of talk about that balance. Sure. Uh, as far as a typical week, so every semester you have two classes every normal semester, you have two classes. Um, and they're roughly, I mean, of course it fluctuates from week to week, but they are roughly the same time commitment between each class every single week. Um, and I know the program at least officially estimates those to be seven to 10 hours per class per week. Um, I have found that to be pretty accurate for me. Um, and since I, I mentioned before, I work two part-time jobs, but the way I've structured it is that I have all of Monday and, and half of Tuesday off. So I treat it like a work day. You know, I get up first thing Monday morning, make my breakfast, I sit down and I watch my first lecture. Um, so every class has a weekly lecture. Sometimes it's two shorter videos and a TED talk. Sometimes it's one longer video, um, but roughly it's about an hour worth of digital content uh, per class per week. And then there are reading assignments. Um, and that does vary a lot. I think also it depends on the the type of reading and what you find easier to digest. So like I said at the beginning, the um, the wine class, the wine intensive class was much more difficult for me because I've never read anything like that. You know, I've never studied alluvial flood patterns from 10 million years ago. And, and reading that in a textbook, if you've never done before, can be a little bit dense. So it took me a while to get into that. Um, so I, I would say as the program has gone on, both in writing and in reading, um, I've gotten far more efficient at it. But it was not easy reading to begin with, you know. Um, but between the readings and the homework assignments, which there is, so there's your, uh, I'm sorry, lecture, reading, and then your assignment for the week. The vast majority of the weeks there's an assignment due. Occasionally you have one that's, oh, this is due in two or three weeks. And here's a small piece of it that's due now, like maybe your outline and then the paper's due in two weeks, something like that. But for the most part, there's something due every week. And um, I'm a, I'm a, I don't mind writing. So it wasn't too bad for me. I also have pretty stringent methods of how like I do a very detailed outline and that helps me write more efficiently. That's what works well for me. I think part of being in a graduate program is figuring out what your learning style is and what your note-taking style and just what works for you. Um, but a typical week, I usually would spend Monday and half of Tuesday doing work. So maybe 12 to 15 hours worth of work. And then I would, I work my other jobs for the rest of the week. And then Sunday or Sunday at midnight is usually when everything is due. I would do, you know, final touch-ups, like my, my proofreading and my sources and everything like that and submit everything towards the end of the week. So for me, that's the way I've done it. Everyone's work schedule is different and um, we're all over the country and, and a few outside of the country. So I know not everyone's schedule meets that, um, but that's what I found that works for me. Great. No, that's that's really wonderful insight. Um, and Tim, from from your perspective, you know, talking about, you know, the the rigor of the courses, what 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 do the educators expect in terms of the 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 quality of their work? And, you know, are there any elements of the assignments that aren't just going to be written based? Is there any other, you know, yeah. types of participation that the students will have? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I just want to also comment that I really like the way you approach that, Jen, in the sense that you gave yourself, you know, several days to like, let that sort of like your thoughts sort of macerate for a bit, if you will. And I, I think that's a really great way of doing it. Um, but there are a ton of written assignments, especially as you kind of like start to ramp up. And technically, the way things work is the beginning of the course, there's usually typically a lot of reading. And so you are going to have a lot of density 
And it's kind of like trying to just sort of get you into, you know, sort of a, a baseline level of understanding of what exactly is happening. And then the assignments start to build a little bit from there. So in the beginning, there might be a little bit more, you know, kind of easier kind of like assignments where there'll be one or two pages of written stuff, maybe something just so you're kind of like getting the information set. And then there's more of these kind of like reflective um, sort of like papers and where you have to kind of like, again, bring your own sort of critical analysis mm -hmm. to the to the party, if you will. And so a lot of that is is what the expectation is going to be. However, I personally like to do, um, especially with some of the courses, especially in my Southern Hemispheres course, I like to try to do um, presentations as well. And so some of the presentations that... Um, I'm doing are, are more so that they would go to the entire cohort. So you'd be essentially learning from each other uh, during that process. And one of the things I, I revamped a lot of this, uh, Jen, you would have missed some of this stuff, but um, you know, I revamped some of this stuff in the sense that um, I changed kind of the way the, the presentations were going. So that way there would be more opportunities for people to learn about specific wineries and maybe specific regions in different places and go into a deeper dive. And so you're not just actually learning from me, you're also hopefully learning from other members of the cohort. And it gives you an opportunity to sort of um, comment on that um, and and really just sort of like have it be something where you're you're really learning as a group and you know, you're responsible to the group in some ways for the presentation itself. So there's a lot of those types of things, um, as Jen sort of alluded to, you know, sort of setting up your own um, uh, spirits brand. That was um, that was one of my things that, you know, one of the ideas that that kind of resonates really heavily with me. And then also just other other types of um Things where you'd have to come up with a marketing campaign, different things like that, where you have to like kind of use the, the basic principles around marketing and sort of essentially create some sort of marketing campaign for a particular brand. Um, all of those kinds of things to sort of try to, you know, hit all of the aspects that are involved in the in the world, the business of, of beverage, because we are definitely talking about what it is, but we're also really focusing on the idea of being ready and prepared to be in the business of this. So the whole idea is you're going to be able to, you know, you know, close the, this chapter and you're essentially fluent with what's happening in the world, in the business world. And, and that's really the goal, especially with my courses in particular, I, I, I don't want to speak for every other professor, but I think that's the goal of the entire program. But for me in particular is if you haven't left my course and had full sort of exposure to all the ideas and thoughts that are current, um, then, you know, you're, you're, you're missing something. So I want to make sure you get all that. Um, and if you don't mind, actually, before you jump to the next question, I just wanted to kind of reiterate what Professor Rosinski said about responding and learning from each other, because the question that I get really often about this program is, oh, is it, you know, you're never in a classroom. I know you meet once at the residency, but do you really know each other? And the answer is yes, we know each other very well. I talk to every single person in this program at least once a week, usually more than that. Um, and not necessarily just about school assignments. You know, I have a good relationship with all of them. And part of that comes from watching each other's assignments and each other's presentations and helping each other say, hey, I got this from this wine. Does that make any sense to you? You know, um, and we we have built that relationship and those assignments where we watch each other's presentations are a big part of that, uh, especially since we are so spread out. And I'm going to double back on that as well. And that's one of the things I really want to encourage because every person in the cohort brings their own specialty. Like, I really wish everyone would talk to Jen when it comes down to a finance kind of thing and just kind of get her insights about that, because this is a huge opportunity. Someone who is highly schooled in this field that is going to be able to sort of break this down and maybe make it easier. All of that is is you know, life perspective, various things, all those things are hugely important in my opinion. Definitely. I, I I love all of that feedback. It's really great to see the depth of the conversations that are happening and and to know like the impact that you as an individual can have on your the rest of your cohort is a, is a really important thing. So I, I appreciate that all the way through. So our fourth question is, how do the home tasting kits work and how are they used in the online classes? So, um, Timothy, we'll, we'll start with you with this question. If you can talk a little bit about, you know, the 
the wines that you share in your classes um, and, you know, just talk a little bit about, you know, how those kits are going to be interacting with the, the online coursework. Sure. So each week that we cover a specific um, country, we'll typically have a tasting kit that's going to correspond with that. And for my course on the Southern Hemisphere, we're really focusing in on the major um, six or seven countries here. So you'll be doing something from Argentina, from Chile. You'll be maybe tasting something from Uruguay, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia. All the major essential players uh, is what we're kind of like looking at. So um, and basically when we do these tasting kits, um, you can see the, the bottles, uh, in the picture here, they come completely packaged. It's amazing packaging actually. Um, and, um, you basically crack those open and there's enough for you to get several tastes out of it. And I suggest that, you know, students taste it more than once because I find that, you know, wines evolve, uh, in the glass, uh, and over time. And so, like I said, try to suggest that um, students do that. So basically what you can do is you can kind of like work through and you basically work through a, a tasting grid. And these grids are basically designed very similarly to um, the types of things you'd be getting in other, you know, certification programs. But um, we really give you feedback on these. And that's really one of the other things. I'll tell you if I think you're really off on something and hopefully maybe you can kind of go back and and look at that wine and see maybe where I'm thinking that that you know things are are positive or negative in that way. So hopefully you're able to kind of like think about like catch some of the things that maybe you're you're missing in some of these wines. And I tend to focus heavily more on things that are are talking about more of the what I call the structural side of things. So I'm not just talking about the flavors and different things of that nature. That's all part of it. But for me, more important things would be things like you know, what is the fruit condition here? Are we talking about something that has a really tart sort of like profile to it? Is it more ripe or overripe? And what's the acidity? What's the, the sweetness level of the wine or dryness for that matter? And tannin structure. So those are really important things because for me, those are the the keys to um, uh, kind of like understanding the wines and maybe also understanding some of the uh, places in which they're coming from. And so you can kind of see like whether or not maybe this this particular vintage was a warm vintage. And so there was a little bit more skin, uh, a little bit more, you know, density to the skins that, that year. And so a lot of the wines are a little bit more tannic than maybe they were in the in a previous year or something of that nature. So in some cases you might have, you know, different vintages in the, in the grouping, or maybe that, you know, producer decided they wanted to go for something a little bit more extracting. And so you get a little bit more intensity in that regard. And so trying to like link that back. And one of the things I like to suggest is that you go back and, you know, research the wines after the fact and see what was done, you know, in terms of the production of those after you look at those wines uh, and after you submit your stuff. So then that way you have a, a really good understanding of what you were tasting, what happened and what they were producing and, and the vintage as well. So that that's terrific. Thank you for that explanation. And for you, Jen, you know, what was it like, you know, receiving the wine kits and, you know, storing them? Was it was that a challenge by any stretch? And were they good? <laughs> yeah. uh, good is subjective. Yeah. That's <laughs> one thing I've learned. But um yeah, it was it was really easy. Honestly, um, we received an email from Kathy, who's the director of our program right at the very beginning, maybe a couple of weeks before the program started that said, you know, here's the link to Master the World, which is the company that ships the shipments. We had a, a code basically that was gave you the uh, what semester you were in, you know, their package that was already designed for the CIA. Um, and we pretty much just had to put in our shipment information. Um, and it's comes in a, a couple of boxes. It was just like getting any other package. You store it um, to the best of your ability, like you would store wine. So in a, a dark space, you don't want to put it in a bright, sunny window because you're not drinking them immediately. It takes over the course of the semester to, to drink them. But I didn't have any difficulty with it all, with it at all. And um, there is one shipment that you get every semester. So there were four in, in total. Um, it was... They're fun. Uh, are they good? That's an interesting question. <laughs> sometimes they're good and sometimes they're not. Um, and I think that part of what you're learning, like Professor Brzezinski was saying, is yes, the the structure, right? The acidity, the tannin, the um, and but I think more importantly, you can only do that by 
repetition and by seeing it because a lot of that the way the vernacular the way you talk about wine is you know light medium heavy or low to to high and all of that is relative so you may try something and say oh like that's that's pretty light but relative to other similar things it's actually rather heavy so mm -hmm. i think that you have to have a lot of wine to be able to have that conversation um from an educated standpoint and so i do agree um that it was interesting and you have the the grid the template that you fill out that says you know here's where you fill out acidity here's where you fill out your flavors that you detect um and i i found the feedback really valuable for this actually i remember one thing i'll never forget and like i said i'm i was a beginner absolutely coming into this program and i remember the first semester professor dufo who taught my first uh, wine class said that i think you are mistaking flavors of really sweet things with sweetness. Mm. Um, like I was putting off dry when I was getting honey flavors in something. And just because you have that flavor doesn't necessarily mean you have the sweetness associated, right? It's an association that your brain makes. So um, things like that are, are some of the feedback that I received that I found really, really helpful. Um, and just to address, we got a question here about, about live tastings. The tastings, none of the tastings are live unless you make them live with friends or members of your cohort. So I do, I have done tastings via Zoom with other members of the program, but it is something that we set up independently. None of the ones, uh, at least when I did it, were officially live. Great. Thank you for adding that. That's definitely uh, a valuable insight. Um, you know, with the... with the I, Before you go, Robbie, sorry. Um, and just one of the things I was thinking about was, I think most of the tastings for my grouping are are due on like Fridays or something. I've been trying to get them so that I think they're going to be due on Fridays or something like that. I don't know if that's possible or legal, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to try to do that. So that way I can maybe do a tasting with me on a Saturday. So the, so the five or six times um, there would be something where you could kind of hop on uh, and maybe do something that way. I, I have to work this out. It's like literally right in front of me. I'm trying to rework this out now, but um there will be opportunities also to get a little bit more direct feedback. I'm hoping at least from my class. So don't yeah. hold me to it yet, but it, I'm working on it. That's, that's great. Um, one, one follow-up question that I was going to ask to to you, Jen is, so how, how does the assignments associated with the, um, the tastings work? Are you doing like message board posts or are you doing a whole paper? Like talk a little bit about what, what that experience is like. Yeah. Good question. Um, they vary, but the majority of the tasting assignments were, you have, anywhere between two to six tastings, depending on how significant of a wine producing region you're talking about, right? If you're talking about Northern Italy or, or Italy, it, there's massive amounts of wine production there. There's massive amounts of diversity. So there were more tastings associated with it. So you have your region, you do your tastings, um, and then you have usually an essay. Um, the essays were, I want to say, I don't know, three to five, six paragraphs, again, depending on how many wines there are to talk about. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a difficult thing. I think more importantly is is tying it back to what you learned, right? Um, I mean, I'm not the one grading, but I can imagine your professors are not looking for you to say, this tasted like lemon. Like, no, that's written on your grid. You don't need me to write that. You need me to say, why does it taste like lemon, right? Because it comes from high acidity, because it's from a cooler climate, because it's high elevation, because this, that, that, the things that you get from the reading and what really make you remember, right? I have always found in studying uh, that I remember things when there's a reason why, and when that reason makes logical sense, not necessarily that I memorized it, right? So I can memorize the flavor profile or the grid for an Alsace Riesling, but it's so much easier when you understand the cause and effect of everything. And, and in my experience, that's what I've gotten most out of the wine tasting activities. So they're not necessarily interactive, um, but they have been like, that's what I've gotten out of them. No, that that's great, and I think that's an an important sentiment is that it's understanding the why more importantly than just memorizing everything associated with a wine. And I think that's paramount to really just CIA learnings in, in general. It's not just a matter of memorizing a recipe or memorizing what a wine's supposed to taste like. It's about learning the the reason for all of it and the science and the procedure that goes into everything. So I love both of your answers for this. This was a good slide. <laughs> um, so we'll move on to our fifth question. 
Um, and this is an important one. This is one that I definitely get a lot of questions on um, and talking about the residencies, like what are they going to consist of and, and really why are they important? So, Jen, if you want to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, your experiences mm -hmm. in the residency, you know, what was the first one like and uh, and the second one? And we'll, we'll leave Timothy for the, the third one since you haven't been to the third one yet. <laughs> no, I haven't. Um, sure. The first residency was five or six days and it was at the uh, Copia, which is in Napa Valley campus of CIA. Uh, there in my cohort, there were 18 of us. I want to say there's 17 now, but we started with um, upper teens. And the first day you are put together with the food business and you're in kind of a big lecture hall. And it's really a standard introduction. If you've ever been to any kind of big conference, we talk about learning styles and, and you know, education and you do all of your necessary things like making sure everybody has their name tags and you're registered properly and you know where you're going and things like that. So of course uh, it starts off like that. And then pretty quickly we transitioned into a small classroom. And like I said, we were small, so we all fit in one room. And the, I, I think they named the residency Viticulture and Viniculture because it was the foundation. It, it was a foundational class. It was all about, and um, the way they structured it was we would talk about vineyard orientation and then we would take a field trip to a vineyard and go into the fields and talk to the farmers about their orientation and why their fields were oriented that way. Mm -hmm. And then we would go back and we would talk about the life stages of a grape. And then we would go on another field trip where we would talk to a proprietor or a winemaker about how they know when their grapes are ready to pick and how they test them and um, prune them based on different styles. So I think that the program, the first residency, like I said, was amazing. I learned so, so much from that. Uh, you also learn how to taste wine critically and, and not just, you know, take a big sip and be like, love it or not. You learn how to take a step back and look at it critically and then smell it critically and then taste it and what the different parts of your mouth mean when they're, you know, sending receptors to your brains, like what that means, acidity versus sweetness versus astringency. And um, it's, uh, it's a really intense week. You know, it's 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. pretty much every day. It's it's intense. It goes very quickly. And I it was one of the best weeks of my life. I loved it. I loved being there. And it was crucial as far as building relationships with the other members of my cohort. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had, I think, maybe one dinner that was sponsored by the program altogether. And other than that, we were on our own for dinners, which was really cool because if you've never been to the Napa area, there's an abundance of phenomenal restaurants there. And even if by the end of the day, you're like, I really don't want any more wine right now. There's just, it's great to, you can walk to most places and um, it, it ended up fostering a really strong relationship with, between myself and everyone in the program. Uh, and we, it was, so essentially it would be classroom, field trip, and kind of a debrief at the end of the day. So, Wonderful. and then the second residency was also in California. That was more at Greystone campus, which is, I want to say 30, 40 minutes away from Copia. Um, and it was similar uh, where we would have, you know, a, a class led lecture and then a field trip. Um, that was also where we did our spirits tasting, which um, you'll learn in this program based on different law. The, the United States has a really complicated alcohol legislation. So you can't ship certain types of alcohol to every place. It depends on where you live, where it's coming from, et cetera. So wine is the only thing you can ship. So we were not able to receive shipments of whiskey and gin and sake and, and all of that. So we did all of those tastings in person, which was intense. It was a very, very long day. Um, but we also, through that day, got to meet Professor Wolf, who who led that class, who we otherwise, because he's based in California and we're virtual, we otherwise would not have had the chance to meet him. So that was really valuable. It also was just great to see everyone after having a year of online classes and, and talking on, on messages and emails and everything. So um, the residencies are, are really intense, but they are so important to making it more of a cohesive program and not just a class you're taking online. Oh, that's, that's really important to, 
to, to have. And that interpersonal connection is one that I hear so often from students that getting to meet each other, it's it's not just you on an island that you're actually, you know, participating with a group of people. So it's 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 special to have that that cohort formation and you know, you're not divided in any way. It's you know, you're you're together throughout the whole program. So it's a really intimate setting in that regard. Um and Timothy, if you can talk a little bit about, you know, the third residency, obviously we'll get into the capstone on the next slide, but um if you can talk a little bit about that third residency and what that entails. Well, in when you get to Hyde Park, it's um it really, it, you know, it feels like that culmination. It is that coming together of all the hard work that you've been doing, not just over the course of the summer and maybe the, you know, your last regular semester, but all the way through the program. And when, you know, I'm seeing, you know, members of the cohort come in, it's, it's just this wonderful kind of like unity that I see with them that they are this kind of a little bit of a cohesive group and they're so happy to see each other again and be with each other again because you know it only happens every so often in some cases I know I've seen people visit different places and visit each other you know out of out of what do you call it but this is the time when you're kind of together again for that one last time and it's it's a really um you know, it's really wa wonderful to see. And they, you know, come to the campus and, you know, eat at the different restaurants. And, um, you know, of course, we have, you know, wineries and so forth here. Um, Saki Brewery is opening up. So we're hoping we can manage to be doing some of those things. Um, they say they're going to get it open this year. So knocking on wood on that. So it's um, getting there. It's close. <laughs> yeah, it's very close. <laughs> And so, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's just a really wonderful time to sort of kind of bring everything together. And it's in in my in in for me, actually, I had only met some of the people for the in person for the first time. So, um, uh, so that was really important for me. But no, that's that's wonderful. Um, and that's kind of the perfect segue into our our next question and talking about the capstone project. Um, we'll start with you, Timothy. If you can talk about, you know. You know what that entails and um you know what sort of concepts you've seen come out of it and just you know what the overall element is and you know how students will balance that into their their second year of the program wow that's um that's a that's a big that's a big thing right there yeah. so the capstone program is a is a really intensive project in which you're um, presenting a concept or an idea to the cohort and to your educators um, and so you, there are many steps throughout this process. You have to come up with a uh, a concept early on. Would you say, I'm going to refer to Jen exactly when maybe you have to do that sometime in your kind of like last semester before the summer semester. And then you um, have to essentially start prepping that. You have to get advisors involved and we're going to help kind of guide you through that process of how the presentation is going to go. You'll have to um, essentially you know, write uh, uh, an essay uh, sort of preempting that sort of before you kind of like start your final research in that process. And then you're going to kind of develop this uh, idea. And I've seen any number of things kind of like coming through. I've seen different distribution models, even from the food studies side. Actually, I've seen some that have were really great. Um, one was, you know, like a just a, a late night takeout healthy food option kind of place that would be located in major cities and, and different places like that, kind of catering to the people that are not working the regular nine to five, but giving people something other than just, a, you know, the, the regular burger and fries and tacos or whatever it happens to be at, at you know, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night and stuff like that. So just really interesting, creative ideas, um, different things where um people had social missions attached which were some of my personal favorite things where they had social missions attached to their their businesses or their programs or their ideas and how they were going to use this to develop within the community itself and so all those things are really really wonderful parts of it as far um as far as i've seen in terms of some of the most creative stuff but it is a it's a it's an intensive process it's kind of very you know very similar to kind of your master's thesis if you will mm -hmm. and so you have to put a significant a uh, bit of work into that. It's it's not sort of um, an easygoing thing, and then you have to kind of do the presentation part as well. So then you'll you'll be here on campus and you'll present this to the the rest of the cohort um, as well. So it's it's a it's a really great opportunity, and again, you get more feedback at that point as well. So 
No, that's that's a perfect setup. And Jen, you're you're in the midst of it all right now. So um, if you can tell us a little bit more about your experience with it, and and if you're willing to share some of your concept that you're sure. developing, uh, we'd love to hear it. Yeah. So uh, either of you, feel free to correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. So I'm making some assumptions because, like you said, I'm still in the midst of Capstone, so I have not seen the the full process yet. But we did submit our initial proposals, which was just you know two three paragraphs, basically a, supporting your idea, what you want to do back in September. So at the very beginning of this year, those were more or less approved. Um, I think maybe people. That some feedback was just to expand or to get more specific, but um, for the most part, they were widely accepted. Uh, that was September. In February, we had to submit our committee, which is essentially you have three or four professionals on your committee that, that agree to advise you and give you feedback on your project. Um, and if and then just last week was my first week of capstone class, which is the last summer semester is your capstone class. So it's a three credit. So it is as much work as a, a full class. It's not just a project. Um, I think that gets a little lost in kind yeah. of the, the descriptions of everything. It is a full class and there's a, a research paper. Um, so it's not just, you know, a poster board project. It's a, it's significant. Um, but uh, some of if if my understanding is correct, the purpose of Capstone is kind of the culmination of your education to this point and where you want to go forward with it and what you want to do with what you've learned and apply it to the world, right? So some of the ideas that I've heard so far from my cohort are things like, um, like a tailored, uh, um, sorry, a, um, a, subscription, a wine subscription box for veterans that comes with a packaged and stories from soldiers from that region in the world where battles have been fought. And uh, ones that are uh, the, the intensive process that goes into developing a wine label and the marketing around designing a wine label, you know, not just the, what's printed on the bottle. Um, some are, someone is um, participating in and, and this is a real project, it's actually happening. He's consulting with someone opening a, a liquor store, a, a wine specialty mm -hmm. store. Um, mine is a Connecticut food and wine festival. So as you can imagine, I'm from Connecticut. Um, we don't have one of those here. So we. I was kind of inspired by Hudson Valley, right right around the, the CIA area, and they have a massive food and wine festival. And part of what I did over the course of the past two years was everyone, one of our projects was we were assigned a state and we had to talk about the wine industry in that state, the history and current events and, and et cetera. And so I ended up doing Connecticut and, and finding that there's actually a lot here. And I'm not going to go so far as to say it compares to Napa Valley wine, right? But that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of rich industry. So what I'm doing essentially is taking local building a local community around food and wine and breweries and distilleries and, and all of those things that we do have here and kind of sh trying to shine a light on the small family owned producers. So that is my capstone project. Um, there is an associated research paper, like a, a thesis paper. Um, mine is centered around the idea and this has not actually been approved yet. So probably going to change by the time I finish writing it, but mine is centered around the, the concept that uh, community gatherings and sponsorship is beneficial to society as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so that's your, you know, your, your paper supports your final concept, though they don't have to be exactly the same thing. You know, I'm not doing a research paper on how to throw a festival. If that makes sense. No, that that definitely makes sense. And something that I've heard, you know, from from students and their their experience with it is, you know, with the capstone project, as you said, like you 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 kind of informally build an idea at the start of the second year of the program, and then it it evolves. It almost like goes through an incubation period where you're getting influences from not only you know people in the cohort, but your professors, and kind of working along that process. And that these ideas develop over time. And it's not just you know you need to come into the program day one with your capstone project in hand. Like it's really about the evolution of the program. And you know I, from what you've saying, that sounds pretty accurate. So that's that's fantastic. I thank yeah. you both for you know insights into that area, which is definitely an important important one for the program. And then the last of our 
formal questions that we have um, is, you know, really we'll start off with you, Jen, and this is why should students choose this program and, you know, how is it going to impact their future? You know, how do you see this program impacting your future and, you know, what has it meant for you being a part of it? It's meant quite a deal to me being a part of this program. I, like I said, kind of found it incidentally. I was looking haphazardly about culinary school and just trying to find a way to make a career shift that I, I knew that I wanted, but I didn't know how to start it. So this for me is, is jumpstarting the transition to the future and the career that I think that I've always wanted. Um, and what I've found most valuable about it is that it not only taught me the foundation that I need for that career, but it also taught me to apply what I already know and what I already do to a new career. Um, I think if anyone here is considering a career change, that's a huge part of it is the question of, did, have I been wasting my time? You know, what about all of the work I've done, all of the studying that I've done so far? And I personally, as someone who loves to learn, I don't believe that there is anything in the world that is completely irrelevant, right? Anything that you can't take what you've learned and apply it to something new. So this program is incredibly unique. Like we mentioned before, there are very, very few wine master's programs. And as far as I'm aware, beverage master's programs in the country. And it's, it is most definitely a conversation starter. Every time I tell people like masters of wine, like that's so cool. And it's, it's definitely been because networking also, when you're, you're looking for a new career or even just to grow your career, one of the most difficult parts is, is talking to the right people and, and all of that networking. And it has absolutely been helpful in that aspect of helping me have those conversations, but also meet those people with which to have those conversations. No, that's, that's definitely important. And thank you so much for sharing that. Those are sure. powerful words to, to share with the students for looking at this program for the future. And Timothy, in, in retrospect, in kind of reference to this question for you, you know, you as an as somebody who's been a part of the wine and beverage industry now for so many years, you know, what skill sets do you see coming out of this program, you know, really impacting students for the future and, you know, their careers? Well, I've kind of tangentially kind of answered this question a couple of different times before, but um, I, I will say that if this program was available when I was kind of like going through and I kind of graduated, uh, culinary, I would have strongly considered jumping into this program because um, nothing, you know, this is a really rapid start to a deep level of understanding of the business. Um, it kind of gets you there to a place in a, in a pretty quick two year kind of like swing a period of time. As I said before, this is really the most, um, you know, deep dive that you're going to see on places like you know, Argentina and Chile and Uruguay and Brazil. And you're going to be talking about, you know, Israel and, you know, Cyprus and China and Japan in terms of what products, you know, are being produced in these areas. And yes, you're going to be talking about every nook and cranny of France and Italy and Spain and Portugal and Germany as well. It, it's, it's unfathomable to me in some ways that, you know, this is what's kind of like being offered. And then as Jen was pointing out, you know, as we talked about already spirits, cider, which to me is one of the most exciting uh, industries out there. It's, you know, it's a burgeoning industry and it has so far to go. Uh, and it's really kind of only getting its, its, you know, infancy kind of like, it's only still in its infancy. So um, it's just starting to get legs to a degree. And so there's so many different things to explore and there's so many different directions that you can go with this, but you're also going to have the ability to, you know, walk into that interview and understand what is being thrown at you because people are going to ask you about, you know, these ideas or, or your concepts about how, maybe how you're going to um, set a pricing structure for, you know, their, their product, if you're going to be the GM of their winery or something of that nature. Well, you would have at least already had 
done that maybe two, three times, per, perhaps maybe during the program itself, having to figure out how, you know, your pricing structure is going to work in, in various places. So there's so many different ways that this is impactful. It gives you all the, basically, you know, all the lingo, all the language that you need to be aware of, all the concepts we're looking at, you know, in entrepreneurship, all the changes that are afoot in the beverage industry up to the current minute, like some of the most, you know, recent things that have been, uh, are kind of like trends that are being happening are things that we're looking at in entrepreneurship and, and how it's changing the beverage industry uh, day by day, year by year. So we're really trying to think about all those aspects. And it really is, it's not just a kind of a stagnant course, a program, you know, it's, it's something that's continuing continuously evolving each year. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, up to date, up to speed. Terrific. So there's there's a couple questions in the chat too. Yep, and um, we'll uh, if any we'll we'll move into that. But thank you so much for those initial questions. We do have a couple of questions that have come through. Um, if anybody you know else watching has any additional questions they want to type in, we do have some time to to address some of the more individual questions. Um, you know, one of the the questions we got you know really kind of stems to getting exposure to winemakers and and vineyards and and you know really just getting an in person experience with with wines in the industry. Um, you know, Jen, you talked a bit about that. Um, you know, in your experience during the first and the second residency, can you expand on that a little bit and, you know, just kind of share your, your experience and, mm -hmm. you know, you being a, a career changer and not having a lot of experience prior, you know, how did that help set you up for where you are now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so there were um, opportunities to meet people through the residencies. Like I said, we took a lot of field trips uh, to various wineries and producers went to a cooperage um and just we talked about a lot of different aspects with those different people i think the program tries really hard to talk about one thing in the class and then show you it in in real life to demonstrate it and and have give you the opportunity to talk to someone who does that in real life so i think that's very well done um I can relate to your concern of you know like i said i'm in rural connecticut it's not exactly like there's an internship opportunity right down the street for me, you know? So uh, as with any graduate level program, I do think that some of it is you need to take the initiative to reach out to people and say, hi, I'm doing this. I want to learn from you. Can I shadow you? Can I do this? Can I, you know, and, and you do have to take that initiative and, and put in that effort. No one's going to hand it to you. So it's not like there's a sheet that says, here's people you can reach out to if you want this. You do have to, to work for it. But I know that the Culinary Institute has a massive network, um, not just in the food space, but also in, in the beverage space. And I know that um, like one of our professors helped connect me with a volunteer opportunity in New York City, uh, pouring wine. I ultimately wasn't able to do it. It was a time thing. But if you take the time to build those relationships and say, hey, I I want um, experience in this aspect. Can you help me? You know, talk to other people in your programs, talk to your professors and say, you know, this is what I want to do. Can you, do you have a place that I could interview someone? Do you know someone I can interview? Do you know someone I could intern for? You know, um, there is a lot of opportunity out there, but you it's not going to be handed to you. You do have to seek it out. And it it takes time building those relationships. You know, no one's just going to give you a job, which is not yep. obviously exclusive to the wine industry. That's just how the world works. You know? Definitely. Yeah, in some cases, we actually also, you know, ask you to actually go and start to reach out to people in your areas to, you know, talk to them about their what, what it is that they do. So we're very much encouraging that you connect with your local community to a degree and find, you know, different ways in which, um, you know, you can sort of start to build that network right where you are to a degree. If you haven't already, perhaps you already have that really cohesive, you know, sort of network put together, which is great, then it's going to be easy. But we definitely encourage more of that and, and kind of like, you can go beyond that. You can, it doesn't have to be somebody necessarily. I, you know, with one of the assignments I had, some people, you know, interviewed people totally across the country because they just wanted to kind of like reach out and kind of connect to somebody else and find out what was happening in those areas. So you can do these things. Um, you can make 
what you can of that. So that's great. Thank you both for for addressing that so well. Um, one important question um, with regard to sort of the the cohorts themselves, and Jen, you you're you know in the midst of one. Can you talk a little bit about you know some of the um, other members of your cohort and just their you know where they're coming from, a little bit about their backgrounds, like what's the diversity of the group like in terms of their experience and you know the industries that they're coming from. Sure. Uh, like I said, there are either 16 or 17 of us. I am probably making the most significant career change. Most people have some sort of involvement in the industry. That's not to say everyone by any means. Um, there's someone else who works in tech sales. We have a chaplain at a children's hospital. We have a, a military consultant. Um, but we also have several people who work in restaurants. We have a few people that own their own restaurants and want to expand their beverage program at their restaurant. We have people who want to open a wine store or a, you know, a liquor store. Um, we have, I know we have someone who has quite a few years in restaurant experience, but wants to develop a, essentially a, a new employment style for restaurant employees where they have benefits and they have training and they have insurance and things like that a lot of times a lot of workers don't have in restaurants so um there is what people want to do with the cohort when they come out all generally tend to be around the space uh the the beverage or food and beverage space but there is a significant diversity of where people are coming from we actually have someone who is a, a professor at the Culinary Institute. He teaches, actually, I'm not sure, a, a food-oriented class and is here just to learn about wine, you know? So there's a few people like that as well. Oh, that's great. And we we got a kind of a, an in-depth question um, here that talks about, you know, being a career changer and, you know, just how how accepting is the industry going to be to, you know, you coming in with this degree and, you know, not having a lot of experience prior to the wine program, um, you know, how has your process been in terms of looking for opportunities and, you know, just, you know, seeing where you're going to end up at the end of this? Sure. That uh, has been difficult for sure. Uh, and difficult, I think, because you also second guess yourself. You say, well, am I really qualified to do this? You know, what what do I really know? It's it's very easy to get caught up in, in that thought process. But for me, what I did start doing last year, last summer, I started working at a local restaurant uh, to get sommelier experience, which I really, I, I'm there usually only twice a week. I do some wine pairing dinners for them. Um, and I, I help with inventory and orders of, of new wines with a distributors, <clears throat> but it's by no means a full-time job. I was, I was really there for the experience to, to a resume pattern, if you will, or just to get a practical application of what I've been talking about in a classroom, right? It's always helpful to see it live uh, and to, to really do it, right? Because the things you learn in class are not necessarily the way things work in the real world. So I wanted to have that experience uh, for myself. Um, as far as networking and looking for new jobs, I have done a lot of I, I go to a, some events, you know, um, like for one of the assignments for Professor Brzezinski's class, we had to interview a local business owner. I interviewed a local brewery owner. I had a great conversation with him and I ended up joining the Cornhole League that's at his brewery every other Thursday night and things like that. Um, I think you have to put yourself out there and I think you have to, I think things like that take a lot of time um, to, to build those relationships. Uh, I have, I got business cards printed. I've been doing a lot of freelance events, um, wine pairing events uh, or wine tasting events. And I give out business cards everywhere I go. And I say, oh, I do private events, but I'm also just working on this. And some of it is, is not necessarily cold calling, but I have reached out to people on LinkedIn or on Instagram and said, I'm so-and-so, I'm I'm in this program at the CIA, I'm studying this, and but have a purpose. You know, don't just say, hi, I'm so-and-so and I'm in the CIA. Say, I want to learn more about this that you do. I recently, just um, a little over a week ago, spoke to a woman who just opened her own winery in Oregon, and she was telling me all about this thing called Oregon Pinot Camp, which is 
awesome. And it's just like a week long festival for people in the industry to go to all these different wineries and they just highlight wineries in Oregon and you learn all about the process. And I just, I found her on Instagram and I just messaged her and I was like, this sounds amazing. I would love to ask you some questions about it when you have time. It took a month to set up the conversation, but I still eventually got the chance to talk to her about it, you know, and, and I think that's just networking. It's hard and it takes time, but that's for me, that's what I've been doing a lot of as far as future career. And I think that's a valuable insight to, you know, networking just doesn't happen because you're, you have a degree networking and, and building, you know, your resume and your career is, is about making those connections and, you know, growing beyond that. So I think that's a really important sentiment and Timothy kind of looking at that question as well. Um, you know, how do you see this, you know, we talked about it a little bit, but, you know, seeing how this education can evolve into the industry, you know, what are some things that you would suggest to students, you know, coming into the program as career changers or even with experience, you know, how are ways that they can elevate themselves, you know, to the job market and the opportunities that, that'll be there? Um, you've worked on so many different areas of the industry, you know, where do these, these, these programs position students for? Well, I mean, I, I think for me, um, you know, this this program is kind of setting you up and leading you towards more of a, a management position, but that doesn't mean that that's the first job you're essentially going to be getting um, when you're essentially doing or in the program itself, for instance. Um, to me, I think the the big thing is, again, it is heavily about that networking and using every opportunity you can. And I like what Jen said also about like trying to learn specific things. And this is one of the things I tell my, um, you know, regular AOS and bachelor students to do when they're sort of starting to form themselves in, you know, uh, as they kind of go through their career path, it's go someplace and learn something very specific that you want to do. Once you learn that, move on to the next thing and the next place and place that you're going to learn that. So figure out what somebody's really good at and try to just learn that one specific thing from them and then maybe move on to somebody else and 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 uh, learn something from them because it's better to get multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. And so if, for my money, that's, that's one way of doing it. And start out small. It doesn't have to be, you know, super big. It's like you don't have to learn how to write a wine list. That's not necessarily going to be your first uh, the first thing you want to accomplish, it may be just understanding how to manage the inventory properly. How are things coming in? How are things going at? Where are they being stored at? How do they make sure that they have, you know, inventory in stock every night? Little things like that can be, can be, you know, super um, helpful. But for me, I also think when you, you know, step out of this program with a master's, and again, it's a very unusual thing. So in, in most cases, that, is indicative of a huge amount of commitment and a huge amount of time and dedication that you're you're putting into this career. And so employers will see this and are going to start to be curious and start to respect this uh, in a way that that really hasn't happened before. I mean, there's certainly degrees in enology. You can be a winemaker and get your master's in that or something of that nature. That's that's a different kind of idea or viticulture, whatever it happens to be. But there's very few chances where you're going to have this one thing. And it's, you know, it's still, Jen is really part of the first online cohort. There's only been one before that. So it's it's a major shift that's changing and people are starting to, to easily pay attention to that. So I think you're setting yourself up for for getting that door open because of the fact you have this master's degree. Definitely. Um, and if you don't mind, I feel like I only answered part of Scott's question. So I just want to go back and tell you a little bit about, because it's a very valid question. Like, how did I convince a restaurant owner to give me a job as a SOM when I had never done it before? And I'd only been in school for like nine months. Totally valid question. Um, I met him kind of coincidentally through a family friend. They said, oh, this is so-and-so. He just opened a restaurant. And I think part of it was one, it was a relatively, they'd only been open for 10 months or so. It was a relatively new restaurant. They had absolutely no idea what they were doing and they were having a little trouble. And I said, oh, I, I, I can help you with wine. Like I, I know a lot about wine. And he was like, that's great. Come in sometime. And it was a very non-committal conversation. And I, I followed up on it. Like I emailed him a few times and nothing really came of it. And then one time I just went in, like, I just went in on Friday night and I dressed up and I 
went in and I talked to the manager for a little bit and he was like, yeah, we don't really have anyone who sells wine. Our, our staff are very young. They don't know a lot about wine. And I said, okay, can I try? And he was like, sure, whatever you want. And I just walked over to a table and sold a $150 bottle of wine in like six minutes. And I got to say that was like, I got really lucky that they actually wanted a nice bottle of wine. Um, and they hired me on the spot. So, uh, not that I'm suggesting you should just walk into a restaurant and do that. Um, I, I got very lucky with that opportunity that it worked out that way, but, uh, part of it is persistence and and putting yourself out there. And I, I noticed you mentioned that people auto reject, go in person, don't go on a super busy time. Go, you know, just go talk to a manager on like an off shift when you'll have time, it'll be quiet. You can sit and have a conversation with them. You can explain to them what you're doing that you want to get experience that you work really hard and, and, you know, you pitch yourself, tell them what you're there to learn and what you bring to the table is, is part of the conversation. Um, yeah, my office experience was not necessarily relevant, but I think that I presented myself as an educated person that is competent and can talk to people and they took a chance on me. And so part of that is luck and part of it is persistence. No, that's that's incredible insight, and I, I really appreciate it. And we have we have one last question that we'll we'll do live. Um, it has it has a few parts that we've we've kind of dove into, um, you know, throughout the the conversation tonight. But um, you know, can we expand a little bit on you know Timothy? If you can share a little bit about you know what's really unique about this program from your perspective, um, you know, having spent so many years in education and knowing the ins and outs of the the wine and beverage industry, you know, how is how is this education special? Well, I mean, I I I've not looked at every program that exists in in what do you call it, but for me, there's no other program that I know of that goes into the depth that we do and talks about business. And the reality is we're setting you up specifically to be in the business of wine. And a lot of, you know, certifications and different things are going to teach you a lot about wine. And you're going to be required to maybe learn something about how to, you know, price a wine or something of that nature. But we're going to deal with every kind of aspect of the business itself. And so in my courses, I try to look at distribution and where distribution is. And then when we talk about entrepreneurship, we're looking at the changes that are happening in the distribution models. And it's hard to kind of make changes in the U.S. distribution model, but it is happening. And so we're going to expose you to that and hopefully create, generate some ideas for you. And in some ways, a lot of what we do in the program is also to help you generate ideas as to how... Um, your next business, in, in other words, not necessarily just working for somebody else, but also generating your own type of business or how you can insert yourself in uh, in a world and doing some consulting things like you were saying, Jen, you know, one of the one of the members of the cohort is actually literally already consulting, um, you know, a business on on how to go forward and how to make changes. Um, so those types of opportunities and things of that nature already are, are super positive. I will say from my perspective, are you going to have to... Um, you know, be able to, to complete a, a sommelier exam? Yes. Will you have to still study for that exam? Absolutely. But all the information and more than you could ever want is going to be thrown at you during this program. Like you will have a detail of information given to you that you would not get in one of those certification programs prior to. I took the advanced SOM course and it, you know, it, it was, you know, it was great. It was Perfect. It was great tasting. But the whole idea is you don't necessarily get the in-depth detail about New Zealand that you're going to happen. That's going to happen in this coursework. I mean, we had a presentation on New Zealand. It was great. But the depth of what you're going to have to study in this is is there because you're going to have to write about it. It's not just listening to somebody talk about it for two hours. Great. That was that was fantastic, Tim. And uh, Jen, if you could just kind of close out with, you know, I know we talked about it in the beginning a little bit, but just kind of close with, you know, what, what really drove you to this program and what made you choose it? Uh, sure. I chose the program and for anyone who, who may have missed it at the very beginning, I found this program like four days before four or five days before the application deadline, because I was working at home and I was very unfulfilled and unsatisfied and bored really. And a, a family friend in the industry suggested that I look at culinary school. She was like, there's so much more to it than chefs, just give it a shot. And so I 
Googled it. I also was concerned. I didn't want to do an undergraduate program. I had already done a master's program and I was like, I'm not going back to undergrad. You know, that's, um, feels wasteful. And, and so I kind of one Google search and I found it, uh, pretty quickly. And I did not look at very many others. I mean, I looked at a few, you know, just I looked for comparable programs and this to me was the most well thought out program. Um, it also of course carries the reputation of the school, which is, um, you know, known worldwide and, and carries a lot of weight, it, at least for me, it did. Um, but, but I just felt that the program was very well thought out and I thought it made a lot of sense. I thought it was structured well for what my objective was, which was to change industries. Like Professor Brzezinski says, it's not just about the wine, right? You can buy a textbook and and read it and, and study it, but this was, it, it was more than that. And I felt that the way they planned the program um, really just met all of the things that I was looking for. Wonderful. Thank you. Honestly, both of you, thank you so much for your insights and uh, just your stories and your your anecdotes and just your experiences with these this industry and, and the program itself. So I really appreciate both of you taking the time tonight um, to, to be with us. And um, just so that everyone on the, the, the call can have my information. Uh, if you have any direct questions you'd like to follow up with on, I'm happy to connect one-on-one. -on -one. Um, my email is robert.tromblay at culinary.edu. Um, if anybody wants to reach out, set up a one-on-one -on -one conversation, happy to connect that way. Um, but um, again, I thank everyone so much for their time tonight and uh, wish everyone the best of luck. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you all.